I have, at this point in my life, um, 44 years old, been preaching more than half my life. Um, I started teaching Bible studies for uh, our youth group when I was 16. We went to a really tiny church. We didn't have a youth pastor. I was the oldest of the kids that were there. There were about six of us. And so on Sunday nights, I would teach the Bible study. Got to college, got plugged into a, a good college ministry where there was a lot of discipleship. And, uh, and our pastor really cultivated a few of us guys to lead Bible studies and small groups, different things like that. A lot of us, in fact, um, almost all of us are still in ministry and, uh, and still doing work. Um, the two closest friends of mine from college one is a pastor in San Antonio. One's a pastor in Australia now. And, uh, and so we're still doing this. And then I started a ministry called Higher Rock Ministries in 1997. So 22 years ago, I was 22 at the time. And uh, started doing that full-time in 2000. And did that full-time for 17 or 18 years. And so I've been doing ministry a long time. And my preaching has changed a lot. I mean, a lot. Uh, one of my first sermons ever, and I don't remember if I've shared this story with you or not, but when I was about 16 years old and I was teaching this first Bible study to uh, my peers, essentially, I had, a, I had a pumpkin and I had it set on the table and I was talking about a jack-o'-lantern and, and I was talking about, you know, like, yeah, it's Halloween, it was October. And so I cut the top off of the pumpkin and I stuck a candle inside and, and then I put the top back on and I was like, I, I was like, playing dumb, right? And I was like, so what do y'all think? What do y'all think of my jack-o'-lantern? And of course, I was the oldest by maybe like two years. And so the 14-year-olds down to the 12-year-olds were like, well, you know, that's stupid, Ryan. You know, you got to take all the guts out. So we took all the guts out of the pumpkin, put the candle back in, put the lid back on. I was like, now what do you think? And they're like, no, 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 you got to cut the face into it. So we cut the face into it and I put the candle back in and I kept doing it, like as long as I could drag it out, right? Until finally they, all the holes were correct in the pumpkin. And then finally they'd, they're like, oh, you know, you have to light the candle. And so I, that, that was my whole illustration. It took like 20 minutes. And then I said, we're kind of the same. God has to remove all the junk from our lives and cut away all the places that don't belong there. And then once the light of Christ is in us, it shines, you know, but you've got to let God remove the junk from your life and cut away all the places that don't belong. And that was like one of my first sermons kind of thing ever. And that was pretty cheesy. I mean, I guess it works, but there's really no Bible in that, and I wasn't explaining any text, and I don't know that I was really creating a deep love for Jesus or affection for Jesus. Uh, maybe I was creating a deep love for Halloween and, you know, porch decorating. I don't know. But uh, a lot has changed in, in these years. A lot has changed since I've had friends like Micah and Pierce and been able to digest the Scripture with a group of people rather than trying to do it on my own. Uh, I was fortunate enough to have a couple of really good friends in college who were very foundational in that for me. And then for the last 17 years, Micah and I have been friends and Pierce and I've been friends now for at least six years. Um, I would say friends, really good friends for six years. And we've known each other a couple of years longer than that. But just the opportunity to be able to be with other people who love Jesus and love their families and and want to make Christ known in their day-to-day -day lives. And so a lot has changed. And the reason I preface all of that is because I'm about to teach you this text from Ephesians 5 in the third way that I would have taught it. <laughs> um, I, I taught it in one way for years. I taught it in what I thought was a second and yet better way for years. And I I still think it was a better way than the first way, and, and now I'm going to teach it in a third way. So if you would, please, in Matthew, wow, Ephesians 5, if I was teaching Ephesians or Matthew 5 from Ephesians 5, that would be a fourth way to teach it. It would be wrong, so we'll go ahead and throw that one out. But uh, Ephesians 5, 22, for those of you in here who are not married yet or have been married and don't want to be or whatever, bear with me, Okay. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the, but as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be subject to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved himself, or loved the church, and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, the church, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word 
that he might present to himself the church in all of her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and without blame. So husbands also ought to love their wives as their own bodies. For he who loves his own wife loves himself. No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Uh, that is a, a text, right, that gets read at a lot of weddings. And uh, if, if you've been in a wedding, you've probably heard that text read. It might have been read at your wedding. Um, it's, it's one that was probably read at mine, you know? Um, I don't know. But we, we look at this text and we, we say, okay, this is about marriage. And we talk to people about, you know, uh, wives should submit to their husbands and husbands should love their wives like Christ loved the church. And, and I remember writing a paper on love many, many years ago, um, 22 years ago. And, and one of the things that I, I said in it, and I, I noted this text talking to married couples about being married. And I said, look, Christ, the Bible says, loved his wife so much, loved the church so much that he gave himself up for her. And I say, husbands, that's the kind of love that you should have for your wife. You should sacrifice, you should, you should be willing at least to sacrifice yourself for the sake of your bride. And, and it sounds really good, right? Like, Wives, submit to your husbands, and then there's this whole other sub kind of, you know, conversation. Oh, look, I don't mean submit like you're his servant. I mean, and we have to have all these asterisks and all these explanations of what it means to submit, right? And we have to fix it. And I'm not trying to say that, you know, your husband's better than you. I'm saying actually that you're equals because First Peter says this. And like, we have to kind of do all this like biblical gymnastics to try to make the text you know, palatable for everyone in the audience. So wives, submit to your husbands, but husbands, you need to love your wives like Christ loved the church. It has to be a self-sacrificing love. And the man says, well, what about my wife? Does she not have to love me self-sacrificingly? And you go, well, the text isn't saying that. She's supposed to, you know. And, and so it's great. There, there's a little bit of content there about marriage, but that's not really the heart of the text. There, there's some stuff we can glean from it that deals with marriage. But again, that's just not the heart of the issue. If you read the text again, you find that it actually talks really more about Christ and his relationship to the church than it does the husband's relationship to the wife. But let's just read the same text one more time. And it says, wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is also the head of his church. He himself, Jesus, being the savior of the body, the church. But as the church is subject to Christ, so wives also should be subject to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just like Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that is the church, so that he, Christ, would sanctify her, the church, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he, Christ, might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. Husbands ought to love their own uh, Husbands also ought to love their own wives as their own body, for he who loves his wife loves himself. No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, and they shall be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And then this, these two verses normally don't get read in the wedding, but they should. This mystery is great, but I am speaking in reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. The, the emphasis here really is on the, the marriage is supposed to be a picture, a reflection of Christ's relationship to the church. That there's, there's, more, uh, there's more meat in this text about how Christ relates to the church, how the Christ relates to the bride, than there is about husbands and wives. Husbands and wives are just kind of an analogy of it. But again, the, the point here. If we just read that section, okay, which is what I did for years. So you just read that section and then you teach it about, hey, here's what a good marriage looks like. And then you mature and you grow, hopefully, right? And you step back and you go, okay, let's just read this section again and say, this hasn't, isn't actually just about marriage. It's really about how deeply Christ loves the bride. It's really about how deeply and fully Christ loves those who belong to him. And, and we turn the corner and we make it about Jesus. And that's, that's a good turn corner to turn when we, when we take a text and we, and we bring it to the, to the core of meaning that it's something about Jesus rather than something about ourselves, where we get to the end of the sermon and instead of elevating us or our position, we have elevated Christ to his right position. That's a good thing to do with any text. But tonight I want to preach to you the third and 
for now, what I believe to be the most correct understanding of the text. And so see me again in 10 years, right? Seems like every decade there's a big change. If you go back to verse 21, it says, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ, or submit to one another in the fear of Christ, or serve one another, depending on your translation, in the fear of Christ. And then it says, wives, submit to your husbands. So let's, let's take a moment, let's just take, take a breath, and let's try to understand Ephesians holistically. I think one of the biggest problems that I had early on, and Micah continues not as much lately, I'm finally learning the lesson, but Micah continues to remind me because I, I used to say to people like, look, it took me 20 years to get this, so if it takes you 20 years, that's okay. And Micah reminds me that the reason it took me 20 years to get a certain text is because so long I did things in isolation. I did things on my own. So you might get this today, right? Like you don't need to wait 20 years to understand the scripture like it took me 20 years to understand it, all right? That's, uh, don't, don't hear me say it took me 20 years and then automatically think it's gonna take you that long. Uh, hopefully you are surrounded by people who really love the Bible and are challenging you into deeper places. And so Ephesians holistically, rather than just verses, you know, 22 through 33, rather than just this chunk, Ephesians holistically is dealing with this problem. Now, the church at Ephesus was one of Paul's most difficult ministries. And these are not my words. I'd like to point out to you that Paul cites uh, the, church, the churches in Ephesus, or the church in Ephesus, he likens it to fighting with wild beasts. Paul says, if Christ isn't raised from the dead, then I fought with wild beasts for nothing in Ephesus. Like, it, like Paul, Paul's view of the church in Ephesus was that it was really hard and really bad and a, a real struggle. And I would like to remind you that he, in his first missionary journey, had been stoned to near death and left for dead And he doesn't cite that city as his hardest ministry. He cites Ephesus as his most difficult ministry, these wild beasts in Ephesus, these these pagans in Ephesus. And uh, what's interesting is that Paul, on his third missionary journey, spent three years in Ephesus. We find this in the book of Acts. But Paul spent three years, I said in the book of Ephesus, but he spent three years in the city of Ephesus and later wrote them a letter, which we now call the book of Ephesus. But Paul spent three years trying to disciple these people, trying to teach them and train them. And at the very end of his third missionary journey, Paul has left Ephesus and he has left Timothy behind to sort some things out there. He'll write Timothy a letter about how to do that. But here he's writing the saints in Ephesus. And what I want us to understand is something that I think can be very difficult for us to wrap our minds around. And then for me, It's not, now it's more like, it's difficult for me to remember, to keep it in the forefront of my mind. So there's a, there's a time that we come to a truth about something and then we, we forget it maybe, or, so here's the truth. The truth is that the Jews, the, the the people of God, the people who originated from this nation of Israel, they've been scattered through the whole world. They were scattered through the whole world. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago, two weeks ago and three weeks ago. They were scattered through the whole world by the Assyrians and then by the Babylonians and then uh, subsequently by the Persians. And so the people of God, the Jews, are scattered through the whole world. And in Asia, there's a Jewish synagogue. And in Greece, there's a Jewish synagogue. And in Turkey, there's a Jewish synagogue. Uh, All over the world, there are these Jewish synagogues where Jews are meeting and worshiping and praying that the Savior would come. That's what they're praying for. And then Paul, on his missionary journey, starts to go from town to town. And the Bible says in the book of Acts that Paul, as was his custom, spent three weeks in the synagogue in all these towns that he went to. And he preached to these Jews scattered throughout the world. And he said, hey, the Savior you're waiting for has come. Jesus is here. And inevitably, there would be a group of Jews who would rebel against that and want to kill Paul. But then there would always be a group of Jews like Jason and Lydia who would say, hey, we want to hear more about this. Come into our home. And they would begin to meet as a group of Jews with Paul. And they would hear more about the Messiah, Jesus. And they would put their faith in him. And they would come to life and to salvation. Now, Even those who came to faith in Jesus, these Jews scattered throughout the world, speaking different language, even those who came to faith in Jesus still had personally a very difficult time when Gentiles wanted to come to faith. The Jews just did not believe that 
the gospel, that the good news of Jesus was for the Gentiles as well. The Jews believed the Messiah was theirs and that they had like ownership of them. After all, all the scriptures had been written by, for all intents and purposes, Jewish people, right? And, and all the scriptures were prophesying that he was going to come, the Messiah was going to come, the Savior was going to come through the line of David, and, and, and it was all Jewish. And so the Jews believed in their heart that the gospel was for them alone and not for the Gentiles. And Paul, in the book of Ephesians, is kind of addressing this. He addresses it in Corinthians. He addresses it in Romans. It's addressed in the book of Acts, uh, this division, Acts 15, this division between the Jews and the Gentiles. Jews were coming to faith. Gentiles were coming to faith. And they kind of split and stayed on opposite sides of the aisle, if you will. The Jews were kind of okay with the Gentiles coming to faith so long as it didn't overlap with their having come to faith. Does that make sense? There was this... It's, it's a shame that it existed, it still exists, but there was this racial barrier between these two groups of people, both professing faith in Jesus. And so Paul, in Ephesians 1, and I am not going to read the entire book to you, but uh, it's not long, it's only three pages, we could do it fairly quickly, I can talk fast, but here we go. In Ephesians 1, Paul talks about we were loved, we were chosen, we were the chosen people of God. We were loved. We were adopted. The we there, the we there is the Jews. We the Jews were the chosen people of God. We the Jews were adopted into his family. We the Jews were loved by God. We the Jews, he says, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. And then he turns a corner in verses chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, and he says, And you also, when you believed, received the promised Holy Spirit. We Jews... We were the first to put our faith in Jesus. We were the adopted ones. We were the chosen ones. But it, it turns out it wasn't just for us. You also, when you believed, he says of the Gentiles, you received the Holy Spirit. And he says of the Gentiles who are putting their faith in Jesus, you were dead in your sins and trespasses. But then Paul says, but so were we. There's a you and we all through chapter 1. And the you and the we is you Gentiles, we Jews. Yes, you Gentiles, you may have been dead in your sins and your trespasses, so were we. We have been brought to life and so are you. So what he's doing, what Paul is doing is he's laying the groundwork for the commonality of these two people who culturally were very different. And he's saying, you Jews, yes, you were loved by God. Yes, you were adopted by God. Yes, you were given the Holy Spirit. But you Gentiles also received these same things by faith. Yes, you Gentiles, you were dead in your sins and trespasses. So were we as Jews. And that way, whoever's reading the letter of Paul, whether they're a Jew or a Gentile, they can know precisely where they stand. Because if Paul had just said, we Jews were adopted, we Jews were loved, then the audience, right, the Jewish crowd would be like, yeah, that's right, it's us, it's us. And then he says, but you also, Gentiles, when you believed, you got it. In fact, in the book of Acts, Paul at one point is preaching and when the Jews reject him, he says, for this reason, we'll go to the Gentiles. And the Bible says the Gentiles rejoiced to hear that the gospel would be coming to them as well. Like the Gentiles were eating it up. They were like waiting in the wings to hear, is this for us too? So Paul makes it very clear. Yes, we Jews were the people of God, adopted by faith, loved by God, elect by God. We received the Holy Spirit, as did you guys when you believed. You were dead in your sins, you Gentiles, just like we were once dead in our sins. And then in chapter 2 of Ephesians, Paul says this. He says that there was a chasm, there was a gap between the Jews and the Gentiles. And he says this, he says that God, Paul says that God broke down the wall, the dividing wall of hostility, so that the two people, Jews and Gentiles, could become one people in Christ. It's interesting because a lot of people, I guess because Ephesians 5 addresses marriage, a lot of people will read that verse from Ephesians 2 and say, God made the two people into one, and they think it has something to do with marriage. It has nothing to do with marriage. It's, there were Jewish people who had put their faith in God. There were Gentile people who had put their faith in God. And there once was hostility between these two people. But now because of their commonality in Jesus Christ, they have been united into one purpose, one person, one faith, which he, he gets to in chapter four, but I'm getting ahead of myself. 
So Paul says this in chapter three. So, sorry, chapter one, we Jews were the first to hope in Christ. We were the elect. We were the chosen ones. We received the spirit. You also, Gentiles, when you believed, received the spirit. There used to be hostility between us and you, us Jews and you Gentiles. We used to hate one another. But instead of two people coming together before God, he has, through Jesus Christ, made us into one people, worshiping and proclaiming the glory and the beauty of Christ. Chapter three. This is a mystery, Paul says. This is an astounding thing that people in the former generations never comprehended. Here's the astounding thing. He says it. He says, let me speak plainly. Here's the astounding mystery that even the Gentiles would be received by faith into the gospel. He goes, no one in previous generations even fathomed that that would be the case. No teacher was saying, hey, The Messiah is coming, not just for the Jews and for the Gentiles. The reason the teachers weren't saying that is because they didn't understand the prophets, because the prophets had said that. The prophets had declared that the Messiah would be not just for the Jews, but for the Gentiles as well. But the people were of hard heart and hard minds and deaf ears and blind eyes, and they just didn't see it. But Paul says, this was a mystery that not just the Jews would be saved, but that the Gentiles also would be saved. This is chapter 3. And he says, what a beautiful mystery it is. And he goes, so that through the manifold wisdom, wisdom through, through the, the beautiful wisdom and richness and beauty of the church, Jews and Gentiles, together united in Christ, that the manifold wisdom of God would be made known to the rulers in the heavenly places. I want you to think about that for a minute. Paul says that the unity of the church that those who once were at odds, those who had been the elect and those who were added in by God's grace, those who had uh, from the beginning received God's love and those who were brought into God's love, both having received the spirit, both having been joined into Christ, that their unity together would be a testimony, not just to the world, but to the spiritual forces in heavenly places of what God has accomplished through Jesus. That the church holistically unified in Christ would declare Christ to spiritual forces in heavenly places across time and space, that somehow the unity and the richness and the beauty of the church would declare the magnificent wisdom and power of God. That that's why the church had been unified. Now in chapter four, which we call ourselves the 456. It comes from Ephesians 4, verses 4, 5, and 6, which says you are one body called to one hope by one spirit. We have one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Some people use this text to say, see, there's only one God. That is not what this text is saying, although the Bible does say that, that there is one God. That's not what this text is saying. This text is saying, you on this side of the aisle and you on this side of the aisle, we have the same God. You on this side of the aisle and you on this side of the aisle, we have the same faith, the same spirit, the same hope, as Micah said a minute ago. This is our hope, the return of Christ that we will see with our eyes, the brilliant face, bright as the sun of Jesus Christ, as he descends at the sound of the trumpet with the voice of the archangel, as the sky splits open, that we together collectively will serve the one Lord with one faith, one hope, having been immersed, having been baptized into one baptism of Jesus Christ. And he says, having said, The Jews started, but the Gentiles have been looped in. The dividing wall has been broken down. And your unity is imperative for the displaying of God's manifold wisdom across the world. And he says, so remember that you collectively share one hope, one spirit, one God, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And then he goes on to talk about what I call, you can call them whatever you'd like, but I call the teaching gifts. And he says, some have been called prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, some, what's the other one, apostles. And he says, this is for the equipping of the body, for the equipping of the saints, not the individuals, but for the equipping holistically of the body so that they can then accomplish the purpose that was just outlined in chapter three. He goes, there's a purpose for you. And then in chapter five, he begins to tell them to walk in a manner worthy of these things. Walk walk according to the calling that you've received collectively. He's not speaking here to individuals. And then we get all the way down, we get all the way down 
to 521. And serve one another, submit to one another, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Keep in your mind now the context. It's really easy, right, for us to to throw aside the context and just to think automatically here about marriage because it's how we've always heard Ephesians 5 taught. But what he's doing is he's saying the unity of the church, the unity of the church is imperative for, for the manifold wisdom of God to be displayed. God has established the church to express his manifold wisdom. So serve one another. That's Paul's instruction to the church. And then Paul is going to highlight probably, hear me say probably, put an asterisk there. If you write it in your notes, don't say, like, leave yourself a little room, which is what I'm trying to do with the word probably, right? Right? Paul highlights what are probably the six most common roles that exist in the church. A husband and wife, a father to his children, and a servant to a master. And then he says this, serve one another. Wives, serve your husbands. Husbands, love your wives. For just a moment, I know it is, okay, I'm not going to say it's difficult because you're probably smarter than I am. For me, this was difficult because my brain keeps wanting to default to to marriage. Let me give you an example. Micah said something to me about a month ago that has kind of become my new thing. I keep repeating it to myself. And uh, as it's probably been two months ago now, but we were working out at the church and we were uh, laying out what will be the coffee bar in the new church building. And we started talking about it. We had knocked down a wall that day. And when I went home, I realized that, we had, that when we had done the measurements, when I, to be more precise, had done the measurements, I had forgotten to measure the walkway behind the bar. So in my head, I'd only measured the bar and the space in front of it. And I thought, oh, we've got plenty of room, but I forgot that anybody who's making the drinks would need space behind the bar as well. So I hadn't figured that into the measurements. And I came back to Micah and I, the next morning and I said, it's not gonna work because I forgot to measure this part. And he would say something, I'm like, no, it's not gonna work. And he would say something, and I would say, no, it's not gonna work. He goes, stop. It's not gonna work based on what we discussed yesterday, but you're acting like that's the only possibility. Scratch everything we said yesterday and start over. And I went, oh yeah, that would, that would work, right? Because I get locked into this way of seeing things. Anybody else? Where you see something a certain way and it's really difficult for you to kind of step back and maneuver your way around and see something fresh, right? So I get to a text like Ephesians 5, and in my mind, I go, it's about marriage. I'm locked in. I'm gonna ask you for just a moment to fight that. If that urge is in you to see this text in one way, I'm gonna ask you to fight that because while it does address marriage, it is not addressing marriage for the sake of marriage. It is addressing marriage for the sake of the church, Church, be unified so that the manifold wisdom of God can be displayed. Serve one another. If you in the church happen to be a wife, serve your husband. If you within the church happen to be a husband, love your wife. What's at stake for Paul here is the unity of the church and not the unity of marriage. Does that make sense? We want to make the end game, the goal, be about marriage. It's not. It's about the body of Jesus functioning holistically and functioning whole and healthy and strong in unity. So Paul, in his letter, whoever's reading it, I hope that they read it with passion, right? Instead, like, instead of like Ferris Bueller's teacher, you know, or something uh, but like, can you, can you hear him? Like he's, he's pleading with the Jews and the Gentiles who, whether they're sitting on opposite sides of some room or not, or whether they are just at odds with one another, he is pleading for them to recognize their unity in Christ. And he says it is imperative that the church demonstrate according to God's manifold wisdom, the beauty and the riches of God that he has displayed in Jesus Christ. It's imperative that we as the church recognize that we are one with one another, that we are unified in Jesus. It's imperative that we as the church serve one another and immediately the brains of the people perhaps going, how do we do that? And he goes, here you go. Here's how you serve one another in the body of Christ. If you're a wife, serve your husband. If you're a husband, love your wife. 
And then look at the next thing that he says. See, we, we want to get to the end of chapter five and stop and go, that's all there is about marriage. But if I was teaching a parenting conference, I'll use the next few verses. <laughs> Except for Paul has a purpose in mind. Look at 6.1. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment that comes with a promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. These couple of verses fly under the heading of, hey, church, serve each other. So those of you who are in the room who are children, how do you, as the church, help demonstrate the manifold wisdom of God to the nations and to the world and to the spiritual forces in heavenly places? How do you do that? You serve your parents. You honor your parents. And parents, you don't exasperate your children. He's not giving specific instructions here about parenting techniques, this isn't like, hey, let's, let's, let's unpack really good parenting. Dads, don't exasperate your kids. Don't annoy your kids. And kids obey. Like, that would be a very short book. You could put it on a postcard. That's not the heart of it. While that might be the application of it, the heart of it is that the church would function well. And then look. Verse 5. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh. So they're your masters according to how humans work. That's what it means by according to the flesh. According to the earthly standard, they're your masters. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in the sincerity of your hearts, as those serving Christ, not by way of eye service, as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will, render service as though you're serving the Lord and not men. Knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he receives back from the Lord, whether slave or free. And masters, do the same things to them, to your servants. And quit threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven, and that he has no partiality. Here's what Paul just said. I'm not just worried, Paul says. I'm not just worried about the racial divide of the Jews and the Gentiles. I'm worried about how the church misrepresents Christ because of the divide in the home or the divide between the parents and the children or the divide between the servant and the master. And he says, so then, because the church is supposed to be a pinnacle of unity in Christ, redeemed by the blood of a resurrected king, because that is true, Wives, serve your husbands. Husbands, love your wives. Children, obey your parents. Parents, train up your children in the fear of God. Servants, serve your boss, your master, as though you were serving Christ himself. And master, remember to treat them with the same kind of affection because your master, this is Paul's words to the masters from an earthly standpoint, because your master and theirs is in heaven and he doesn't play favorites. In other words, you and the servant both stand before the master even. That's why Colossians 2 and Galatians 2 talk about how in Christ, sorry, uh, Colossians 2 and Galatians 3 talk about how in Christ there is neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. Because those of us who name the name of Jesus have been unified into one person. So if you're teaching a marriage conference, right? You use the last part of chapter five. If you're teaching a parenting conference, you use the first four verses of chapter six. If you're talking to a group of CEOs, you use the next three verses to talk about how they should treat their employees. And then after that, if you're having a different conference that deals with spiritual warfare, you use the last part of chapter six. I want, I want to point out to you just kind of the ludicrousy of that. That in the space of one page, you can say, well, these four things are completely unrelated. I'll use this section to talk to, to husbands and wives. I'll use this section to talk to parents. I'll use this section to talk to CEOs, Christian CEOs, of course, right? How they should treat their employees or maybe just a group of people who are working for somebody. And then I'll use this section to deal with spiritual warfare. And those of us who grew up in a Baptist background say, we won't get into that one. I probably won't go to that conference. It'll make me really spiritually uncomfortable. And, and so we take these texts and we make them all different things. But I wanna point out to you, look at uh, 610. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For your, oh, We missed this. Look at verse 12. For your struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the worldly forces of darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. 
for your wrestle, for your struggle, for your fight, for your warfare, isn't against flesh and blood, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, your struggle's not with them. Be servants of one another. It doesn't matter if you're a husband or a wife. Your struggle's not with your spouse. It doesn't matter if you're the father or the child. Your struggle's not with them. It doesn't matter if you're the slave or the master. Your struggle's not with them. Our struggle is with the spiritual forces in the heavenly places. The very same thing, the same exact language that he used in chapter three, where he said that we, the church, unified are supposed to be a testimony to the spiritual forces in the heavenly places of the manifold wisdom of God realized in Jesus Christ. Quit fighting amongst yourselves. Quit finding ways to be disunified and instead come together around the cross of Jesus Christ. Celebrate at the empty tomb. Come to the place where we collectively say we are the church of God but born by the purpose of God, according to the wisdom of God, by the mystery of God that we might express, not only to the world, but to whatever this means, to the spiritual forces in the heavenly places, the power and the beauty of God accomplished through Jesus Christ. Listen, please. We, when you leave here tonight, It's okay if you say, man, I I, want to have a good marriage or I want to raise my children well or if I'm a boss or a servant, I want to do those things well. That's all fine and good. But the purpose of this text, Paul, when he says, serve each other, submit to one another, the purpose is that in so doing, as we join together around the cause of Christ, the person of Christ, the blood of Christ, the cross of Christ, the empty tomb, and the one day coming king, that as we join together with those hopes, by that power, filled with that spirit, with one faith, serving one Lord and one God, the aim is that we, as the church, would demonstrate the manifold wisdom and the richness and the glory and the beauty of God. I want you to think about this for just a moment. God's aim for your marriage isn't that it would be good and whole just for the sake of it being good and whole. His aim for your marriage is that it would be good and whole for the sake of his glory and his name in the church. It's not just that fathers would parent their children well and train them up in the things of God just for the sake of training up children in the things of God, but so that the church would be whole. And that those of us who are employees, I'm self-employed, my boss is a jerk, but that those of us who are employees and those of us who are bosses, and my employee is very lazy, that we would come together not for the sake of having a good work environment, but because we have come together to know Jesus. And the reality may be that you're a wife, the reality may be that you're a husband, the reality may be that you're a father, the reality may be that you're a child, the reality may be that you're the worker, the reality may be that you're the employer, and you may be several of those at once. But Paul's aim isn't just about fixing a two-person dynamic. His aim is about the manifold wisdom and glory and beauty of God being displayed throughout the world through a church that functions like it should. Our aim is higher than a healthy two-person dynamic. That's fine, it's a great byproduct. I am very grateful for the marriage that I have. It's a great byproduct. But it's not the end goal. The end goal is the health of the church and the demonstration of the beauty of God. Does that make sense? That when we read the text, 
it matters that we read it holistically. That we read it and wrestle with it and struggle with it. It also matters that we're very careful not to wrestle and struggle with each other. For our wrestle isn't against each other. We're on the same team, bought by the same blood. I am excited to be part of this with you. And until Jesus comes back or until he removes me from the picture, I don't mean here as the pastor, I just mean dead. I was just trying to be nicer about it. Unless Jesus comes back or I die, I long and I look forward to with you demonstrating the richness and the beauty of Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, you have beautifully made yourself known to us. You have beautifully demonstrated your grace and your mercy. Some of us in this room, God, feel like outliers and outcasts, but we know in you there is no partiality. Some of us have felt like slaves and some of us have felt like masters, but we know with you there's no favoritism. That you do not view one of us as higher than another, that there is not one who has received more grace or more love or more spirit, but that we together, who have named the name of Jesus, are bound together eternally through the blood of Christ, through the empty tomb, through the confession of his name. And that somehow in your beautiful, powerful wisdom, you have appointed us, the church, to make your glory known. Not just on this earth where the sun rises and falls, but also among the spiritual forces in the heavenly places. And I pray, God, that as we go out from this place tonight, we would remember that our struggle, our fight, isn't with each other because we are one in your name. Let that resonate in our hearts. Whatever tension we may feel with our brother or sister in Christ, whatever turmoil we may deal with, Lord, may our hearts tonight be filled with the truth that we are one. And may your name rightly be glorified in us. It's in the precious and holy name of Jesus Christ that we pray these things. Amen.